Good evening. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center for our program tonight featuring Ms. Karen B. Hill. My name is Dr. Stephanie Lampkin. I am the curator here at the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. The National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is a museum of conscious and uh, an education center, excuse me, and a convener of dialogue and a beacon of hope for inclusive freedom around the globe. Our mission is to pursue inclusive freedom by promoting social justice for all, building on the principles of the Underground Railroad. And one of those individuals that we emphasize and celebrate here at the Freedom Center is Harriet Tubman. We are very proud to be able to host the sculpture, The Beacon of Hope, which was created by Wolford Sculpture Studio and is featured in our front yard. I call it our front yard, but you saw it at the main entrance. It will be here at the Freedom Center until April 30th. So you are welcome to come back, take pictures. We do encourage that you can interact with it, hold her hand, um, and do share those photos with us um, on social media. Um, with the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. Now to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, we are very honored to have Ms. Karen V. Hill here tonight um, to help us open Women's History Month. Um, so for us, as we transition from Black History Month to Women's History Month, uh, this is probably the most opportune time to really feature and dive into the life and legacy of Harriet Tubman. Ms. Karen V. Hill is president and CEO of the Harriet Tubman Home in Auburn, New York. In her leadership role, Ms. Hill has successfully pursued federal legislation to have Harriet Tubman's home become one of the newest units of the National Park Service. The Harriet Tubman National Historical Park has the only extant resources related to the life and work of Harriet Tubman. Prior to her role as president and CEO of the Harriet Tubman Home, Ms. Hill spent nearly 30 years working on affordable housing developments for underserved communities where she worked to desegregate the city of Yonkers. Just a round of applause for that. Ms. Hill has served on the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission and has worked as a program director for the National Urban League. Ms. Hill graduated from Simmons College and is a member of the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority. Okay, okay, yes. <laughs> and the Westchester County chapter of the Lynx. She's also a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And with that, again, we are honored to be able to host Ms. Karen Hill, and I will turn it over to her, who will give us a wonderful presentation on the life and legacy of Harriet Tubman. Um, being 
spiritually engaged and in touch with herself. And so there's some, you know, those are some of the important lessons that I've learned from Tubman. And if you, if you come to our Tubman Park, it's her actual homestead, 32 acres. It's in central New York, in a little small community called Auburn, New York. And it's known as History's Hometown. And quite frankly, Harriet Tubman is the big, big draw in the town. That's where everybody comes to Auburn. Um, but just step onto her property, her land. She was a land owner. And she understood that that was important. Particularly in the time when she was born, it afforded her certain rights that she otherwise would not have had, neither as an African American or as a woman. And to, and to step onto her land, I know it's like a hallowed space. You know you're someplace special. One of the uh, important events that takes place pretty much annually at the home in the latter part of the summer is that a lot of people, they want to take their oath of citizenship at the top of the market. It means something to them. And to see people of every hue, every station in life, become our brothers and sisters, join us in, in, in citizenship. And they want to do that on the land that was owned by Harriet. And they want to breathe tough in air. And there's something extremely special about Tubman Air that I hope to share with you this evening, <clears throat> that everyone will go away from this place feeling more fulfilled, more able, and know that they've got to keep going. So that's, that's what I want to share this evening. Tubman was one of nine children, and that was indeed masterful, um, quite a feat. Her parents, her mother was born a slave, her father was born a free, was a free man. And so that, you have that family dynamic. They were owned by two different slave, uh, slave masters. And um, Tubman was the typical middle child, okay? Uh, one of nine, she was number five. And her, her siblings were uh, Lina, Mariah, Reddy, so those three were born deep were sold deeper into slavery because the Thompson plantation where Tubman lived, the father died, the son took over, and he had gambling debts to satisfy those debts. He had to sell some of his property, so he sold three of his slaves. And the women were extremely marketable because in slavery, we didn't record when people were actually born. We recorded for the women uh, what we thought to be their child, how many more childbearing years did they have, you know, because that was the commodity, bringing forth more children, bringing them into slavery. And then she had a brother, father, then came Harriet Tubman, and Harriet Tubman's birth name was Araminta, Araminta Ross, and she changed it, her first name to Harriet, a free book. Uh, her brother Ben, her sister Rachel. And Rachel's story is a very tragic one. She actually ended up, Harriet went back to rescue her, and Rachel had died and left the child. And Harriet was distraught over that because she couldn't convince Rachel to leave before that. So she brought Rachel's daughter, North. Her brother Henry and a brother named Moses. And so I think it's not coincidental that we know Harriet in popular parlance as the Moses of her people, but she actually had um, a biological brother named Moses. Um, so she married John Tubman, who was a free man in Maryland, but they didn't have children because Harriet didn't feel that anyone should be a slave, that God didn't want anyone to be a slave. And she could not imagine making a child and then having that child be raised a slave because that that's what would happen to her. You know, Harriet was a slave, so her offspring would be slaves. 
Um, and later on, we found out that Harriet's mother, when she reached a certain age, age 45, and, and um, uh, uh, brothers, John Brothers died, uh, and Dr. Thompson had died, or Anthony Thompson had died, he said that Harriet's mother should be free. And they kept that a secret. So that they, you know, they continue to lie. And how many people have seen the movie Harriet here? Has anybody seen? So you know, they have that scene on the steps where she says she has a letter and her mother should be free. They tell her to shut up. Get back, you know, at Sunday worship service. Well, that actually is is true. They did find the documentation that that her mother should have been free, which meant all the offspring should have been free. But that's not what happened. So. Harriet knew she had to seek her own freedom. She did that, we saw that. Um, she, now, let me just set the record straight. She made nine to 13 trips that we can document into to Maryland along the Eastern Shore. She actually freed 70 people herself. They were mostly family and friends. And then she gave instructions on the route to another 70 people. And I've heard people say, oh, she went back 29 times, she freed a thousand people. No. Do, and, but don't diminish what she actually did, because that was greater than what anybody could have imagined at that time. So just, just try to, a big part of my job is to tell the truth about and truth telling isn't always easy when people have their own uh, preconceived notions. Um, so she, you know, she came to Philadelphia and it was great. That was the first time she'd been around free blacks in abundance at every station in life. You know, that was just amazing, a new experience. And it was wonderful, but Tubman was lonely. So that's really what led her back to get her and her friends. And when she went back, longing for um, her husband in particular, uh, he had remarried. And she didn't know. Now in the film, for those of you who've seen the film, you know, there's that very melodramatic scene between Tubman and her first husband, John, um, between Harriet and John. Well, in actuality, when she got down to back down to Maryland, she found out that he remarried, and she refused to see. She did not want to set her eyes on him. She said, you know, God has called me here for another purpose. I thought my purpose was to come and get my husband and my family, but my purpose is get my family and friends and begin that Harry had a, a belief in God that was so strong and so powerful, and it became more powerful after she was hit over the head uh, with a, a metal object uh, when another slave was free, was fleeing the Buck County store in Maryland, and then the owner went to strike that individual and struck him. Tubman in the head instead, and her mother nursed her for almost three months. She was in a coma. And she came out of that experience saying that during that time, she communed with God, mm -hmm. that she felt closer to God while she was in the coma. And throughout her life, thereafter, she suffered epileptic seizures. But it was during those seizures that she said God spoke directly to her. And, you know, when I first started this work, and we're a 501c3, we're not a religious corporation, I was really not quite comfortable talking about Harriet's faith, and I had to become more comfortable with that if I wanted to tell the truth, because her faith was the number one of her core principles, having that faith in God and in God alone. Um, and her, her seven core values were faith, freedom, community, 
self-determination, social justice, uh, and equality. And um, those are values that I find very useful today, that if we take any one of those four values and try to lift it up, we will be so much more fulfilled uh, as individuals. So she gets to Auburn, New York, and that's where um, I manage the public part. And the women's suffrage movement is in full swing with Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady standing. And um, Anthony was, was a fairly decent person. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, not so much. <laughs> uh, you know, she, it, you know, the dichotomy was that she was really good. She thought that Frederick Douglass was just, he was like the intelligent one. You know, someone who she could relate to, trust, and that Frederick Douglass delivered the eulogy of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And you'll find when I give these talks, I give all these little sidebars that are not really part of the fucking talk, but I think it <laughs> kind of fills in if I'm telling this, if we're, if we're being for a cocktail or something, <laughs> this is what I would be saying. So, uh, so that, was, that was just interesting how she made him the exception, because she found, uh, she called uh, all other black samples you know, and just thought that they were just less than nothing. And um, that's interesting when you're leading a movement <laughs> to increase the franchise of women. Uh, but you know, the women's suffrage movement, when we actually passed the 19th Amendment giving women the power of the vote, it didn't include any women of color being included in that. Okay, that was only for white women. But Tubman and her gift of discernment knew that expanding the franchise for women would eventually lead to the franchise being um, expanded to women of color. You know, without the expansion of that franchise, we would have no Fannie Lou Hamer, okay? Uh, you know, advocating for, for all people to be able to not be suppressed in exercising their, their right to vote. So Tucker comes to this area in central New York, which is just, um, you know, her heart is broken, her small step husband. But she has some family with her, and she just, just really gets busy with seeing, you know, that central New York was the sort of the headquarters for the abolitionist movement. Okay. William Seward and his wife Frances, uh, they lived about a mile and a half up the road. And Tubman brought her first property, which was an assemblage of seven acres from the Sewards who owned it originally. And Seward, we all know who William Seward was. He was, he, he debated Lincoln for the Republican nomination. He never owned a slave. Uh, he was the governor of the state of New York. He was Lincoln's secretary of state. And it was it was pure genius that Lincoln knew to keep your know, you keep your friends close, your enemies closer. That's how William Seward became the secretary of state, and he was responsible for our purchasing Alaska on uh, Seward's Folly, which is our most mineral rich state of the fifty states. <laughs> So, you know, she's there with, with, with all these leaders in the abolitionist movement. She's there with the leaders of the women's suffragist movement. This is just right territory for Tubman. Now, she lives for 54 years among these people. And that's a long, long time. And during that time, uh, she was able to influence the thinking of the abolitionists. You know, that she's very much about, I can do anything that you can do, and I can probably do it better. She's very, very clear on that. I mean, who volunteers for the Civil War when they just come out of bringing, doing 13 trips of bringing people 
levels of breathing. Nobody but him. Who functioned as a nurse, as a scout, and a spy? They thought Tubman, who was barely four feet eleven, because she was small in stature, because she had the seizures, people actually thought she was a dumb person. Like they would talk freely, military leaders in the Confederacy would talk openly in front of her because they thought they were talking to an ignorant black person. And she was absorbing every single detail. She led the raid along the Cumbie River. Does anybody know about the Cumbie River? Okay, Cumbie River is, is an important river in South Carolina. It actually um, flows through Beaufort County and Collegiate County. And she helped to free 750 slaves because why? The Union Army needed the men to become Union soldiers and help fight the war. So she led a regiment of, of eight men, and they had, you know, she had scouted the scenery. Everybody knew what they were supposed to do on cue, and then just like it depicts in the movie, they just came out of the woods at night and got in boats and were rescued. And that's, uh, there's a new book by uh, uh, Edna Fields Black that's about to come out or has just come out um, that delves into. So that was, she was the first woman in our country to lead an armed raid into enemy territory. I mean, that is quite, quite something. And the uh, uniform military intelligence part of, the, of, of our uh, defense system has inducted her as a full-fledged member of sort of their spy family because she was that intelligent. Now, you don't become that intelligent unless you are, you know, she was gifted by God. And I think that that's something we have to acknowledge. <coughs> you know, discovering your gift, whatever, we all have gifts. We all have gifts. But she knew that this was her gift, and she exercised her gift, its power, its authority, in her life. Um, Frederick Douglass was one of her dearest friends, and he wrote very explicitly that you know, he had had the thunderous applause of, of, of a crowd. He had, he, had, you know, he had been invited to the White House. He had been in the halls of Congress, all to promote the cause of freedom. But he says to Harriet, who's one of his dearest friends, had you not did your empirical work to validate the value of freedom, just the value of freedom, my words would have run hollow. That she gave his words meaning and gave his words life. That was really something. She was scheduled to be with John Brown on Harper's Ferry, but they kept changing the date of the reign of, of uh, Harper's Ferry. She was actually ill on the days that they were planning the raid, so she was unable to attend. But she, you know, Harry Tubman said that he was he was white, but he understood the travails of black people in a way that no other American that she had ever encountered understood. Um, and so she, you know, she had these insights. So in Auburn, New York. You know, she's broken hearted. She's living in her house. It's right after the Civil War. And she's taking in orders to help pay for the expenses of running the house and feeding everyone. And one of those orders is Nelson Davis. And he comes back from the war suffering terribly with what we think is tuberculosis, but he was really ill and she was nursing. So she's in and out of his room a lot. Now he fell in love with her immediately. But Harry, being Harry Tubman, she was like, I'm here to nurse you. <laughs> and I can't keep coming into your room like this. It gives people 
the impression that something more than me nursing you is going on and nothing else is going on. So if you want to talk further to me, as Beyonce said, you got to put a ring on it. <laughs> okay. So they got married in a Presbyterian church, and that's the other thing you need to know about her. She's very ecumenical. She visited a lot of just what we call society. You know, to see how they worship, to see what was being preached, and and to really get to know people as people. So they're married in the Presbyterian Church. They had a wonderful marriage. Um, he was a very learned man. He taught her um, her her frame house burned down. Nelson Davis built her a brick house, and that's the house we're preserving now. He was a brick mason. He taught her Matthews because Harriet had no children of her own. But he taught her Masonry. Uh, and you know, and to have that skill set was quite something. Now, here's the other part about Harriet. She says, okay, bricks, bricks are going to be a part of this country in the future. These wood frame houses, we see how they can be torched in a minute. She decided to open a kiln on her property. So she was very entrepreneurial. So she fired the kilns, and if you come to Auburn, you see lots of great brick houses on both sides of the street throughout the town. And many of those homes have bricks that were fired at the Tubman property. And although she couldn't, um, couldn't read or write, she admired education. She knew that education was really important. So she encouraged young people all the time uh, to stay in school, be good students, and when I first came to Auburn, you know, there was just a flood of, of white men and women who shared with me their stories of their grandparents sharing with them how as young children they would go by the Tubman farm and she would give them fruits and vegetables and tell them, recite their lessons that they had learned during the day at school she had her report card even though they couldn't, uh, she couldn't read and she, you know, just the, the, you know, this was a woman who cared for all, all children, all the time. Um, and I think that gift of discernment of something just carried her throughout her life. That's why she so despised the system of slavery. She saw how heinous it was. But she was able to unpack the pastoral, beautiful pastoral landscapes where she grew up from the heinous system of slavery. And when she, when she chose a place to live in Auburn, she chose something that most reminded her of a place where she left. It's very pastoral, it's semi-rural. And that is something, because a lot of times you want to get as far away from anything that reminds you of where you were treated so harshly, of where you were whipped on your back as a six-year-old because you were left to babysit a white child who wouldn't stop crying. So your master just beat you, you know, without mercy. You know, but you could separate how beautiful it is from how awful, how ugly the treatment was that you got. And that Harriet really felt that everyone in this country ought to have access to health care. Okay, so that was very important to her. So she opened up, she built open the John Brown Hall, and she got people from the medical establishment to work with her. And she dispensed free medical care to any and everyone. I mean, that that's just of human kindness uh, that says, you know, your suffering, my suffering, and your suffering are the same if we both are here, okay, you know, um, and if I can be a help, uh, you know, it's like if she can help somebody who really thinks she'll not be in vain, I mean, that was, that was toughening. So, in dispensing that health care gets to part of the work that I do today, we um, in the world of preservation, before you 
restore and reconstruct any physical building. We have to do all of the excavation of that, that land, what's under the soil, what may be of historical value uh, that needs to be preserved. And at the Tubman Home, as Dr. Lampkin indicated, we have the only physical resources that date back to Mary Tubman's time. So at the Tubman Home, we have over 72,000 archaeological artifacts in our collection. And I think I've had this over <laughs> So I can share with you that she was a very plain woman, but she loved her healthy strawberries being given to her and a wonderful personal doctor. We have that. She's a very plain woman, but she loved her very healthy meals being served on which we China. Here we have that. Um, and so that was those were interesting little like oh that's a little different. Okay. Okay. Uh, and I think a lot of us um, remember images of Tubman um, as an old, frail, elderly woman you know, with a shawl around her, her shoulders or over her head and around her shoulders. And that shawl came from Queen Victoria. It was a gift from Queen Victoria. So she was, you know, she was well known. I mean, um, Newspapers were just full of stories of Tubman. In fact, at the towards the end of her life, when she began to get ill, the New York Times just covered her life so e e extensively. Uh, so you know, but the, the shawl is now in um, in the uh, Smithsonian uh, African American Museum for History and Culture. Um, we didn't donate it, someone else had possession of it. That's another story, another lecture. That's over a drink. That's not the public, not for public consumption. Um, but uh, the, the, we did donate artifacts to the museum, which I've seen, which have been on display. And one of the things that happens at the museum, you know, you know that, that the museum Everybody's like the 800 pound gorilla asking all of our institutions to donate, donate, donate. And they got such a tremendous response that that beautiful sculpted building that sits there uh, on the wall can only hold so much. So they have, they're, they're always changing and improving their exhibits. So no matter how many times you go, it's a learned experience every time you go. And they have to, they can't store anything on site. They have to use storage facilities far away from the museum. That's just, you know, museum talk. Um, but uh, so you may or may not see what we donated, but our, our things are there at the museum. Uh, and and it, gave, it gave me a great sense of pride. We had this one, this is an aside, this one night at the museum it open to the general public, where the only people that they invited were people who had related to people who were, uh, whose lives were being shared in the museum and people who had donated artifacts to the museum. And what an experience that was to be just beside all this history. And I remember sitting down next to someone, and he was the professor from um, Bishop College. You know, the great debaters that have been seen that film with Denzel Washington. I think it's Denzel Washington. Yeah, yeah I, and I was just like, oh my God. You know, I mean, just to be around that history. So go to, I'm a big proponent of, of um, you know, you go to Europe, people come to spaces like, like, like this, like the Freedom Center and to museums the way we go to the movies. 
They thought that they could point it. And if you do go to Europe, you go out at 4 o'clock for free. Okay, you to the museums. But, but, but go to the museums. There's so much to learn. There's so much to do. They're more interactive. They're more fun than I ever remember going when I was a kid. Okay. And, and the, uh, the African American Museum is, is, is quite something. So Tuppen's artifacts are there. We have some Tuppen history here. We, when, there was a time, oh, a long time ago, uh, when you all were doing like sort of the time capsule, and you asked us to give you, did you have some Tuppen dirt? Everybody wants the dirt from Tuppen. And we sent it to go into the time capsule here. So that's a good thing. So let me get back to what I was supposed to be talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and govern myself accordingly. Um, so Tuppence, like, you know, it, it was a hard life. It wasn't an easy life. She and her husband, they um, said such thing. She had a broken heart. She got married. They adopted a child, a daughter, Bertie. Um, but she was like mother to everybody, you know. Um, her brothers and sisters, children, she was mother to them. And, um, you know, Tuttle was very close to the sewers. I mean, she, they were like besties, she and the sewers. So she bought a burial plot close to where they had purchased their burial plot because her, her intention was to be buried there. Her husband, Nelson Davis, predeceased her, uh, and he's very close to the sewers, and then she had a nephew who passed away, and he was indigent. So she gave up her burial plot uh, to her nephew. And, um, you know, let me be honest, I don't know if you've all experienced that, but often in our families, we have family members who don't have resources when they expire, and we've all got to do what we've got to do to make it happen. Let's keep it real in this room. And so that's what Tubman did. She gave up her, 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 uh, her plot. And uh, she did buy another plot. It's about 100 or so yards away. And what's interesting, if you come to the Tubman home, you can see like this tree, this tremendous tree that has grown from one bar, absolutely symmetrical, two distinct trees that come. Like, people come and they marvel at it. They can't believe it. And I'm like, it's happening. What, what are you, that's what happens. It's a part of our black girl magic. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, that's, that's a part of, that's a part of Marion. But we have people who go to her grave site, which is about five minutes away from her homestead, and they, you know, they, they practice their faith traditions there when they come and they uh, uh, give their respects to Harriet, um, you know, and we often have to go and clean it off and get ready for the next group of, of visitors. And every May, we were really um, affected by the pandemic, but I'm so pleased to report that in May of this year, we will um, resume our in-person pilgrimages. And so we invite all freedom-loving people. people. It's a great gathering. People come from all over, and we have like a small program on Friday evening, and we honor people. And then on Saturday morning, we have this incredible graveside service. I mean, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. And we have some descendants join us. And then we have a spectacular program on Saturday afternoon. So, if you don't have anything to do the third week of May, you can take a ride to Auburn. You'll be much welcome, and you'll be much pleased because then, you know, in the tradition of the Black Church, we feed you. <laughs> we feed you. We feed you at the end of the day. And then, you know, Tubman became became ill towards the end of her life, and she didn't. She lived in her brother's home. And then she did live in the home for the age, and we've been really blessed with having a family member who donated to us her, her bedroom furniture. 
so we have our actual bed for dresser quilt. Um, now, this is a little, our family Bible. She has a big, white family Bible where others would inscribe the family history because she could neither read nor write. And how many times those of you remember growing up and sitting in, in Grass House, in your own house, the family Bible? And that family Bible is there. And um, when she passed away, you know, her, her final words were, I go to prepare a place for you. And she was biblical. I mean, she couldn't be the right, but she understood that she was ready, you know, for the next part of the journey. And the next part of the journey is where we are now. She helped to build the mosaic of America. You know, in our country, in this culture, we tend to only lift up our modern day civil rights heroes. We think we've done a great thing. We lift up Dr. King, who deserves our full respect. Um, uh, uh, Rosa Parks, Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, John Lewis. These are just some of the icons that all deserve our respect. But none of them would be there if Harry had, Harry had not shown them the way and given them the courage, okay, and the fortitude. And it's, it's so a big part of my job is making sure that our historical figures, such as Harriet Tubman and, and Frederick Douglass, who received his preaching credentials at the Ain Zion Church of New Bedford, and that gave him the great gift of oratory, and Sojourner Truth, changed her name from Isabella Balfrey to Sojourner Truth at the altar of the Mother Amy Zion Church. You know, there's just this, this tremendous history that they all were swirling around America at the same time, changing it and, and continuing hearing the beat of the drum from the motherland to encourage them, you know. Um, and so it's our historical figures that we must lift up. Tubman um, born Ashante in Ghana. The Ashante are the inventors of Kente cloth, you know. Things that we don't know that we need to share with our children so they can share with their children and so on and so forth. Which leads me into the coins, because if I don't talk about the coins, then they're not going to ever invite me back. <laughs> <laughs> the coins, as I said, we started this journey years ago, um, and I was pleased to be able to um, write the legislation to make sure that we had the inclusion of, of the Harriet Tubman Home and the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center uh, in the legislation. And myself and Mr. Keown, we spent so many hours in um, on Microsoft Teams, meeting with the U.S. Mint, who are all wonderful people, but there are about a thousand Mint employees, and there's just he and I, and having to deal with all these parts of the Mint, and, and going through, there, there's a, a catalog of artists that they have under contract who um, began to craft the coins. And we started with a stack about that big with like 18 images on the page. And um, I don't know, is it on me? Yeah. yeah. And we ended up with the three coins that we have, have now. And the coins are so extraordinary. They're, they're exquisite. You have to either see them in the gift shop when you go to consider purchasing. I know they have some here in the gift shop, or you go online and you can see um, a good, uh, if you ever order from Amazon, you can order from the U.S. Mint. It's that easy. It is that easy. Um, but the, the, the coins, the proofed coins, and we were able to, to, to strike both the silver dollar coin and the five dollar gold coin, and 
that was extraordinary because the MIG doesn't let anybody into its facilities to strike gold coins. I didn't even know. I live in the lower part of New York, uh, not about a 45 minute drive from West Point. I never knew that that's where our gold was. It's a good thing, I guess, because Jesse James and me probably would have known something different. But um, we went there and it was just an extraordinary experience to uh, strike both the silver dollar coin, which we've been told after it's no longer in circulation, that it may be nominated for coin of the year. And you can't be nominated for coin of the year until your coin is out of circulation. So at the end of 2024 is when these coins will go off sale. Um, the Freedom Center and the Tub and Home they decide to continue to sell them, but we're hoping to sell as many coins in all seriousness as is possible. Um, the, the 50 cent clad coin is the only coin that has Tubman's image on both sides. It's the image of her Civil War years and the image of Tubman uh, as she led the company and I felt it was important because that's the coin that most of our young people and college students will be able to afford. The coins are not cheap. But that one retails for about $50. The price of the coins change every 30 days because it's tied to the cost of silver and gold. But it's about $50. And I encourage young people that I spoke to earlier to, you know, um, a little less Spotify. <laughs> you know, all of that, you know, a few more dollars to put aside to be able to buy the 50 cent piece would be important for this. So you can pass it on. And then the next coin, the silver dollar coin, um, is a depiction of Tubman in her middle years. And then on the, on the um, and this is something I struggled with the entire time, on the reverse side, the obverse side is the heads. The reverse side, the tail side, is, you know, I just say heads or tails. On the tail side, the obverse side, is, is in an unimaginably beautiful depiction of Tubman leading people to freedom. I mean, it's, people are so struck by it. You have to really see it in person. You have to really, really see it in person. I think you have the opportunity um, to do that, to do that here. And then um, the $5 coin, you know, let me be very honest, I was a huge advocate where the gold coin must be when she lived in Frio. You know, this is a coin that we must have. Little did I realize that that coin cost $736 <laughs> by itself, you can buy the three coins set for about $850. And there are only 5,000 of the three coin sets available. That's, it's a finite number. And about 3,800 of those sets have been purchased already. So if you think you're interested in the three coin set, I encourage you not to tear it, to go forward. Because to see the three coins together, um, to see them in a set like that is just, it brings tears to your eyes. It just, you know, and the, 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 the $5 gold coin has Tubman, she's a little older, but what's important is on the um, reverse side of the coin, along the perimeter of the coin are her seven, coin, uh, seven core values with faith leading at 12 o'clock. So I would encourage you to consider that. And it's been an incredible journey. The Freedom Center and Harriet Tubman Home, we will share in the, sur the, the surcharge from the point. Okay, here's how it works. The mid gets back every dime that it put into making the coins first. And then for the gold point, there's a surcharge that you pay that's included in the pricing that I just uh, discussed of $35 $10 for the silver dollar 
and five dollars for the seven, I think fifty seven days. So we share that, you know, that gets split in half. And it doesn't sound like much, but you know, you've heard the expression that many hands make light work. So if we all buy a coin, we're all contributing to the Freedom Center and Harriet Tubman and the Harriet Tubman College. together, you know, we had about 
Um, for us, we had about seventy-five thousand dollars, eighty thousand dollars, which was a phenomenal amount of money for our little small state. And they ended up spending together about one hundred and thirty thousand. But we would have been able to meet our share of that if we had collaborated. And my thing was, let's bring Harriet home because the photo was actually taken in Auburn, New York. It wasn't taken in any other place. It was taken at Powell's studio on Genesee Street in Auburn, New York. And we knew the date. I mean, we gave that photo value, okay, that it did not have before we did the authentication of the photo. So that's a whole nother. Then the pandemic came and that helped calm me down. <laughs> And now I'll pick up where we left off in the succeeding years ago. Now, bring, bring my girl home, my girl home, my girl home, my girl home, my girl home community. So I, we kind of got this tacit agreement that she will come home to Auburn as a part of the, her traveling back home. And so we've got security measures and everything else that we've got to work out first. But bring my girl home. And um, so, the reason why the, the photo was so important is Frederick Douglass, and I don't think he was a main man, but he knew he was an important man. He was photographed every single time he spoke or did anything. So Douglass's photograph only went for $1,500. Because everybody has an original Douglass. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. And, and so, you know, Tubbins, Tubbins um, the photograph made the national news, it was a big deal. And so, um, now here's a way you can have a piece of, of that photograph. On Saturday, I'll be in Maryland, and that's when the United States Postal Service will unveil Harry and Tubman and the abolition stamps. And the photo of Tubman that they use for the new Harriet Tubman stamp is the one that we authenticated. So rush to your post office before they run out and get your Tubman stamps. <laughs> and, um, and then my little sisters are going to be doing a project with the Tubman stamp made into a lapel pin. This is the first Tubman stamp. Tubman was the first person um, to be depicted on a black history stamp. So this was the first one, and now we have a second one. So everybody, get your Tubman stamps. And people will, will just marvel if you, you know, send them a card and it has Tubman on the front of it. And you'll be quite familiar with all the other abolitionists. So Stephanie, your question was, <laughs> why don't we see? So Tubman, because she was doing this work of bringing people along that network of freedom, freedom seekers more, did not want to be photographed. And I said, sometimes she was as a man, she carried a pistol, she disguised herself. No photographs, no photographs, which is why the, the photograph we have of the young Tubman that was taken at um, Powell's studio is so unique and so amazing. That's how she would have dressed if she were going to Seward House or going to meet with, you know, for a formal meeting with the other abolitionists where she was going to press her cause, cause of freedom and why they have to keep fighting. The other reason um, I want to also to come up to Auburn is because we're about 15, 20 minutes from Seneca Falls. And Seneca Falls is where the women's rights movement was founded. This is Women's History Month. <laughs> and we have along the Erie Canal, which runs this way, but the Erie Canal in New York has, we have the most inclusive statue of Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, um, Laura Kellogg, and I'm leaving somebody out, forgive me. It will come to me, Laura Kellogg, if it was the other person. Um, Amat, one of the Amat sisters, I have to get her first name. Uh, but the four of them are depicted together 
at the statue, and they used to, I don't know if they still do this, but it would light up at night in the colors of the women's suffrage movement, which is white, purple, and gold. And it's just absolutely amazing. But that's why we don't have very many images of Tuppen, because she did not want to be captured. Wonderful. And I want to ask one question, and that's really about younger audiences. And Ms. Hill was here earlier today and spoke to a group of nearly 175 students. And what is the one message that you want, especially as you share this information with younger kids, children, students, what's that one message about Harriet Tubman that you want them to always take with them? Yeah, um, Tubman had intestinal fortitude. She didn't follow the crowd. Um, she did what she knew she had to do to complete the task. She was highly disciplined. Um, I think if we teach our children about proper nutrition, that they're more mindful of what they put in their bodies, we teach them about the importance of knowing the subjects that they're studying in school, um, and, and she also appreciated the arts. So, you know, Tubman is like, be who you are, whomever you are, but do it to the best of your ability. And it begins with you taking care of your vessel. Because that's all each of us are, it's a vessel. To do our best work. Wonderful, thank you. I think we can probably squeeze a little bit of time here for one or two questions from the audience. I apologize for the uh, tightness of the schedule, but another round of applause. Ms. Hill, thank you for such an inspirational and passionate review of Harry Tuckman's life. Considering she did not read or write, how was she able to impact so many aspects of society and influence so many great leaders? Yeah, that's one of the great, um, the great, mysteries, except if you were in the room with her. Uh, she couldn't read nor write, but if you interacted with her, what we know is that people wrote about how she made a lasting impression. And I think that's also an important lesson to learn. It's like putting your message right out front. She did not, she was okay with going it alone, but she, you know, she gave the message, this is what we must do. Don't tell me what I can't do. I will show you how I will do it, and I need your support. I mean, she was, you know, not being able to read and write did not hinder her, but she had such a healthy respect for education. Because she couldn't read and write doesn't mean that she didn't want her nieces and her nephews to, to be scholars. Because she did. She wanted them to be tradespeople. She wanted them to, you know, to know the math of what it takes to, to, to build a house and all of that. Um, and and she, she felt that she was communing with God. I mean, that was just so powerful. It just took people aback. And dealing with uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who were well schooled, who, who, who grew up extremely privileged. Tubman was an equal. She, was a, she, she never stepped into a room feeling like she was inferior to anyone. She stood on you know, her belief system. She stood on her work, let the work and work of them speak for me. Who else was going back into slavery, bringing people out? Who else was going back going into the Civil War? Who else had led an armed raid into enemy territory? Say no more. When she spoke, she had accomplishments that backed up what she was trying to deliver. That's why she was so effective in the lecture halls. I mean, she was really busy being on that circuit. One more, and then for all of you that may have additional questions, we do uh, ask you to approach the cell at the reception. Um, she'll be there to Uh, we have one that was submitted to us. So the question is, as a researcher, what would be a starting point 
find facts and information on the life and lived experience of Harriet Tubman, uh, looking for first-hand accounts. Some of those stories repeatedly state that Harriet was unable to both read and write. Okay, um, I would say uh, to really read down the Promised Land it is a scholarly work. It has been well researched, and then um, you know there's the book. Harry Tubman, Moses, Other People, written by Susan Sarah Bracker, and it's the first edition and the second edition. But it's written in this um, didactic kind of language that really offends a lot of people. Um, that was Sarah Bracker's interpretation, and we feel that a lot of what is in there, it was Sarah Bracker. Embellishment. So I would say Bound for the Promised Land is where I would start. And of course, if you go to come to the Harry Tubman home, um, we have this incredible um, mural that raises a very long wall in our very rusted old visitor center. I long and lust for a space like this. <laughs> But it depicts Harriet Tubman's life of 91 years. It's from the cradle to the grave. And everything that Tubman was doing and why it was important. And what was going on in world history and American history at the same time. That's a great, you know, a, for 91 to just see the, the, the scope of her life and how much the United States change and how much it needed to still further change is incredible. If you come to our business and you get a history lesson on Tubman, we're all things Tubman all the time and it never gets tired. You know, if you're lucky, you'll come on a day when the turkeys and the bears and the everything <laughs> are out there on the land. Now, we do have a new children's book um, for early, you know early middle school readers um, that's coming out and it's going to be introduced at the Bologna Book Fair and then hopefully it'll book be introduced at the Library of Congress Book Fair in September. But what it does, it's, it's an interesting book, it's very important. And the reason I did it, did this book uh, in collaboration with the folk who were involved with Thomas Hardy and his team is because it tells an important, things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen for a reason. The first book that they did it was the Anne Frank House. And now they've done the Harriet Tubman House. And just to see, it allows you to see these two incredible females and their courage and their fortitude and how they use their own clothes do God's work. I really <coughs> encourage everybody to get the book. It'll be out. It's coming out April 24th. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you.